Hi, my name is Kip Nelson, and I'm the online pastor here at Legacy. I am so glad you're joining us today. Before the service starts, I want to encourage you to go to info.lcc.org. Click the Tell Us You're Here banner and let us know that you are worshiping with us today. I also want to encourage you to prepare your communion elements. Later in the service, we as a church family will partake of communion together. If you're new to Legacy, I want to tell you what you can expect. Every week at Legacy Online, you get to worship with people not just here in the Kansas City area, but with people all across the world. You get to engage in live chat, prayer, and hear a powerful sermon. Listen, we're about to go into a time of worship. I want to encourage you, wherever you are, put aside all the distractions. Open your heart to what God wants to do in your life today. Welcome to Legacy. Hello, we are the Under Family, and today we ask you to reflect with us as we celebrate the second Sunday of Advent, as we light the candle of peace. This time of year, it can be difficult to find peace. Christmas can be very stressful for many, but it doesn't have to be when we stay focused on the real story of the season, the story of Jesus, the story of peace. As Isaiah 9-6 tells us, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let us take some time this week to slow down and get silent with God, to reflect on his incredible gift to us of his son, Jesus Christ. Feel his peace. Dear God, just as we come up on this extremely busy time of getting all the families and all the events planned and all the gifts together, Lord, just help us to find find time and um, set that apart for you. And um, yeah, and in that I just ask God that, that you just please just grant us peace in this crazy and busy time. And, um, just find time to, to celebrate God, the, the coming of, of your your son into this world. Um, so yeah, it's your son's name I pray. Amen. We are going to worship our Savior. One week closer to Christmas, we await his coming. Sing this together, angels we have heard on high. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Oh, 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 oh.
Hey everyone, my name is Alan and I serve at the Overland Park campus here at Legacy. And I'm Alethea and I also serve at the Overland Park campus. Thanks for joining us, especially if it's your first time at Legacy. Yes, being part of a biblical community is a form of worship. And you can do that by going to info.lcc.org to check in. Register your attendance by tapping on the Tell Us You're Here banner. If you're a guest, you can also check in and someone from our team will reach out and send you a gift card as a thank you for joining us today. And this is a great time to let you know that your generosity allows us to continue to reach our community for Jesus. And we're so grateful for how your giving allows us to continue to make an eternal impact. So right now, give online at info.lcc.org or for those of you on site, you can drop your offerings in the mounted boxes as you leave the worship center today. I'm so excited to hear God's word with you, but before we listen to the message, check out what's happening in the life of Legacy. Good morning, Legacy Christian Church. Shout out to everybody at each of our campuses and everyone watching online. Uh, when I was a kid, my parents had a Christmas tradition, and maybe you have a similar tradition that your family did, but we would open all of our presents, and then uh, just when you thought the presents were all opened and out, at the end, my dad would give us a clue, and there was a string of clues that eventually led us to the big present. And so this particular year, my little sister went first and she followed her string of clues and discovered that her big present for the year was what she had wanted for several months. It was an easy bake oven. It was one of those little toy ovens where you heat up, uh, you can cook brownies with a little light bulb. And I can't imagine they're very nutritious or very good. But anyways, that's what she wanted. That's what she got. She was excited and she disappeared into the basement to play with her new toy. Then it was my brother and I's turn. In our clues, we, we worked on them together and we followed this chain in our scavenger hunt and it led us to the screened-in porch, that, the house that we lived in. Under the porch swing, there was a Sega Genesis video game system. And we were so excited to get the Sega Genesis and we were jumping up and down. And at that moment, my sister emerged from the basement and noticed the jubilation we felt over our new Sega Genesis and she saw the excitement on her, on her faces, and then she looked down at this soupy mess of a brownie that she had made, and she realized that her expectations had been shattered. She, too, wanted a Sega Genesis. Well, have you ever had your bubble burst? Uh, and not just in regards to Christmas presents, but have you ever ha been disappointed with expectations that you had for your life? Have you ever said to yourself or to other people, I wanted to be this, fill in the blank, but it, it turned out to be this. Or I wanted it to be good, but it turned out to be bad. I wanted it to be family, but it turned out to be a, a, alone. I wanted people to be around me, but I turned out to be, it turned out to be me by myself. Well, today we're talking about this Christmas villain, and each week we've been highlighting a villain or a, a thing that threatens to rob us of our joy at Christmas. And the thing we're going to talk about this week is unmet expectations. 
Now, with each of these villains, we've been offering a Christmas movie that contains an actual villain. And for this one, I think there's no one that represents this villain better than Clark Griswold from Christmas Vacation. In this movie, Clark is his own worst enemy because of his overinflated expectations about how he wants this family Christmas to go. So take a look at this clip. Well, I think what I love about Clark Griswold is because he's so relatable. And this is the first Christmas he's hosting. He wants it to be the perfect Christmas for all of his extended family. But because of his unrealistic expectations, it sets it up for some humorous disappointments in this movie. And so what I'd like to do today is is speak to this uh, Christmas villain of unmet, unmet expectations. And specifically, I'd like to talk to the people here that have dealt with some disappointments this year in 2021. And, you know, not just specifically Christmas, but sometimes Christmas can be the time where we think about all the ways that we've been let down this year or where we have expectations that are sometimes disappointed. And maybe for you, it was a specific gift, like my little sister that she hoped her parents would get her that she didn't get or didn't bring the satisfaction she thought it would bring. Or maybe for you, it's the first year that your kids are going to bring their grandkids to your house for Christmas, and you want everything to be perfect so that they will want to come back, but something went wrong. Or maybe it's the family member that lives in another state, and you're hoping they'll come home for Christmas, but they never do. Maybe Christmas for you means you're reconnecting with someone in your family and, uh, from, which, from whom you've been estranged and you're hoping for some time to set the record straight and have a good conversation, but with the busyness of the holiday, it just doesn't happen. Many of us have experienced disappointments at Christmas, but there's other disappointments in life too. Your children grow up and they never call you when they move away. You lose your job. You lost a loved one, and Christmas is a time where you're disappointed that they're not there. You always wanted a child, but now the infertility question is looming in the back of your mind. Every monthly cycle for you and your spouse is another disappointment. The marriage you thought would last forever ends up in a divorce. Or maybe you're a newlywed and you've started to realize that the things you expected from marriage simply are not true. We experience disappointments in life. On that note, I I thought of these lyrics, this old song, country song from Dina Carter, uh, and here's what she says, flowers and wine is what I thought I would find when I came home from working tonight. Well, now here I stand over this frying pan, and you want a cold one again. I bought these new heels. I did all my nails, had my hair done up just right. I thought this new dress was a sure bet for romance tonight. Well, it's perfectly clear between the TV and beer I won't get so much as a kiss. As I head to the door, I turn around to be sure, did I really shave my legs for this? Now, many of you have experienced the disappointment we find as as newlyweds where marriage didn't turn out to be what you thought it was. Recently, Adele released her album 30, her first studio album in six years. And the other night we watched a special uh, uh, with her performing at Griffith Observatory, and they kind of spliced it with interview with Oprah. And so take a look at this video and look what she says about her marriage. And so if you keep watching the interview, Oprah concludes that, well, what an example you are to unhappy women everywhere which kind of reflects the dominant view of our culture, that if you're disappointed with your marriage, you should just get out and be the example and uh, end that marriage. What an awful view of marriage, but a very popular one in our culture. The point, though, that we can all relate to is that disappointment is everywhere, even in marriage. We experience disappointment. And how do you deal with those unmet expectations in your life? Because life really is a series of losses, and as Christians, we need some tools to help navigate those in a way that helps us to, to stay faithful to God. And so here's the curious thing is that the Bible gives us a lot of examples and touches this subject many times of unmet expectations in people's lives. First one I thought of was Adonijah, the son of Dave, one of the sons of David. His expectations were shattered when his father David anointed Solomon as king instead of himself. 
in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 15, he said, You know the kingdom was mine, and all Israel fully expected me to reign. However, the kingdom has turned about and become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. And if you know the story, instead of submitting to God's plan, Adonijah, when his expectations went unmet, he treacherously tried to seize power and consequently was put to death. Another example is Jacob in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 29. Jacob fell in love with a woman named Rachel and agreed to work for seven years for her father in exchange for her hand in marriage. Now, scholars have pointed out many signals in this passage that show us just how lovesick Jacob was for Rachel. For one, he offered seven years' wages to achieve her hand in marriage, which I'm sorry, and I hope nobody's offended by me saying this, but that is way too much money for the hand of any woman in marriage. Seven years' salary? Verse 20 said these seven years seemed only a few days to Jacob because of his great love for her. This man was so overwhelmed with emotional and sexual longing for Rachel. Jacob thinks, if only I could just get Rachel, then everything would be okay in my life. And some of you know the story. Laban, Rachel's father, tricks Jacob. And when he works the seven years, he goes to his wedding thinking he's going to marry Rachel. And he gets drunk at the wedding party. And Laban sneaks his other less attractive daughter in with Jacob and culture, uh, cultural honor-shame norms at that time meant that Jacob had to marry Leah if he slept with her. And he ended up work, marrying Leah and working another seven years just to get Rachel's hand. And I love Genesis 29, 25. It simply says that the next morning when he woke up with Leah by his side instead of Rachel, uh, Genesis 29, 25 says he woke up and behold, it was Leah. He put all his hope on getting Rachel. But when he woke up, behold, it was Leah. That's how life is. You think you're going to get Rachel and you'll wake up the next morning and behold, it's Leah. In everything in life, there will be disappointments. Nothing will turn out the way that you expect it to. And how do you deal with that? Or what about the book of Job? Job was a man whose life was going great and then all hell broke loose, literally. He lost everything in Job chapter 28. Job launches into a long speech to his friends, reminiscing about the way things used to be before all this tragedy came into his life. He says, why, uh, <clears throat> why have these things happened to me? I've been righteous. I've been good. I've been faithful. Why did this happen? And he says, my hope has, uh, God has pulled up like a tree. And later in Job chapter 30, verse 26, <clears throat> Job says, When I hoped for good, evil came. When I waited for light, darkness came. He expected life to go one way and it ended up going the other. In a more positive sense, I think of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection of Jesus. These two guys are walking along the road. Jesus walks up to them in disguise and asks them, what are you talking about? And they say, haven't you heard about Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified? We had hoped he was the one who was to redeem Israel. They expected Jesus to be the king of Israel, to lead a new revolution against the Roman Empire. Instead, Jesus was crucified. The moment they expected their movement to take off, it was over. They expected the restoration of their people's government. Instead, they would continue to be dominated by the Roman Empire. They also expected this person walking alongside them to be just a random stranger. And what a surprise they would be in for when Jesus revealed that it was he, resurrected from the dead, walking alongside them. How do we deal with disappointment in our lives? I'd like to offer a few biblical reflections uh, just so that as we move into the, the Christmas season, we can wisely navigate our disappointment and manage our expectations since this is something that often steals people's joy at Christmas and other times of the year. So uh, how do we do this? Before, we, you start, uh, before you start scolding yourself, number one, the first thing we need to know to navigate um, disappointment and unmet expectations is to remember that the pain of unmet expectations is real. 
You need to stop and be honest with yourself and say, if when your expectations get let down, when you're disappointed at something that happens during Christmas, you need to stop and say, you know what? I'm really hurt. I'm sad that you didn't come home for Christmas. I'm hurt that life didn't turn out the way that I thought it would. I'm angry that God hasn't given me a baby yet. I'm upset that you didn't call me. Step one is to acknowledge that this pain that I'm feeling is real. Proverbs chapter 13, 12 actually talks about this. It says, hope deferred, uh, and that, that word for deferred in the Hebrew means to, to draw out or to stretch out. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is the tree of life. When our expectations don't get met, either in small things or in big things, it can be painful. It can make your heart sick. You have your hopes dashed one too many times and your heart eventually gets weary. You become skeptical of desiring anything. And I have to fight against this in my own heart. My pathology is to avoid the disappointment of unmet expectations by resigning myself to having no expectations. No expectations of my life. No expectations of anyone around me. It's a form of self-preservation that lets me avoid vulnerability of wanting something and not getting it. And if you take enough dings in your life, it's easy to descend into that kind of cynicism. It is painful to desire something and realize that you're not going to get it. That's what Proverbs means when it says hope deferred makes the heart sick. I remember having a conversation with a girl one time who was expressing her desire to be married. She'd been in and out of multiple year-long relationships and was tired of wasting her time. And she said, I'm tired of getting my hopes up and then being disappointed. And I think it's important that we acknowledge our expectations when they're not met. Christians, unfortunately, are really good at throwing out cliches that prevent us from having space to acknowledge that the pain we're feeling is real. And I think a good practice for us this Christmas is to realize when our, un when our expectations go unmet, to admit that I was really hurt when feel, fill in the blank. So that's number one. Number two, we need to remember that our expectations are often unrealistic. As a human being, you have an incredible ca capacity for imagination and dreaming about your desired future for your life. That's what makes us different from animals. We can imagine futures for us. We can build up things in our head to the point where we're sure that things are going to turn out a certain way. And we tend to have expectations that fall into three categories. First, we have expectations about our life. We have expectations about other people. And we have expectations about God. Forbes magazine had an article entitled, Eight Realistic, Unrealistic Expectations That Will Ruin You. In it are listed eight untruths that we need to be aware of. Number one, life should be fair. Life's not fair, but for some reason we expect that. Number two, opportunities will fall into my lap. Number three, everyone should like me. Number four, people should agree with me. Number five, people know what I'm trying to say. Number six, I'm going to fail. Number seven, things will make me happy, material things. Or number eight, I can change him or her. These are toxic expectations that many people have in their lives towards other people and towards themselves. We also have unrealistic expectations of, uh, on God. When Jesus began to perform his public ministry, performing miracles and ministering to people, he polarized. And on one occasion, Jesus performed a miracle wh where he multiplied fish and bread and he fed 5,000 people. And then he claimed that he was the bread of life who'd come down from heaven and gave life to the world. And that his disciples, if they wanted to be faithful to him, they needed to eat his flesh and drink his blood as the way to true life. The crowds were polarized. Some of them misunderstood what he was trying to say, because that's a little weird thing to say. Other people understood it, but they were offended by it. Because for Jesus to claim to be the bread of life means he's claiming he's equal to God. God is the bread of life, but Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. And so people are offended. John chapter 6, verse 66 says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They simply did not have a framework for a God who would arrive in the form of a man who claimed to be God. 
Christians often hold many expectations of God and of following Jesus that are simply untrue but, and are bound to be disappointed. Here's a couple common uh, um, unrealistic expectations people have of, of being a Christian. Number one, following Christ will always lead to a better life. We know that that's not true. There's people in our church that know that that's not true. Number two, my interpretation of the Bible is the only correct interpretation. That's another unrealistic expectation people have. Number three, if you follow Jesus, you will no longer struggle with sin. Number four, if you're a Christian, life's pain won't hurt as bad. And that's simply not true. Uh, pain is pain, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. Now, if you're a Christian, you have resources and hope and something to put your hope in that helps you. But the pain is still real and the pain is still felt. During the 1952 Christmas season, C.S. Lewis invited Joy Davidman Gresham, an American with whom he had corresponded for over two years, to, send the, to spend the holidays at his home called the Kilns. Joy asked Lewis to autograph her copy of his book, The Great Divorce, and he wrote on its pages, There are three images in my mind with, which I must, I must continually forsake and replace by better ones. My false image of God, the false image of my neighbor's, and the false image of myself. He went on to describe God as the great iconoclast. And then he writes this, every idea we form of God, he must in mercy shatter. Tim Keller in his book on the Christmas story writes this, the purpose of the Christmas story is not to warm our hearts, but to shatter our categories. As we're going to see, everything about the way Jesus was born into this world challenges our previous expectations and ways of thinking about God. It challenges our categories. We need to realize that our expectations about God and life and other people and ourselves may not be aligned with reality. Number three, how to deal with unmet expectations. We need to realize that our unmet expectations sometimes reveal hidden idols. An idol is anything that's taken the place of God in your heart. It's anything that, from which we draw our identity that is not our creator. Some idols are more obvious than others. There's, of course, the big three. Money, sex, and power are the big three. But other idols are more hidden and often are revealed by how we react when our expectations go unmet. I remember there was a girl I was dating at one point in my life, and I found myself drawing all of my self-worth from how I perceived she felt about me. And when we broke up, I was devastated. And after a couple of months of licking my wounds, I realized that I had given this girl way too much power over my life and my sense of self-worth. My ideal future with this girl had become an idol in my life. So when we broke up, it was very painful, but it was a gift from God because it exposed the fixations of my heart that had become idols could it be that underneath your need for everything to be perfect at Christmas are some hidden fixations or expectations that have way too much power over your sense of self-worth? In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul says that one of the worst punishments God can give to someone is to give them over to the desires of their hearts. Basically, give them what they want. Why would allowing someone to achieve their deepest desires be the greatest punishment possible? And here's the reason. It's because our hearts are constantly trying to transform the things we desire into idols. Our hearts are constantly trying to transform good things into ultimate things. Romans chapter 125 says they worshiped and served the created things rather than the creator. And the truth is that every one of us was created to worship something. We must live for something. Something must capture our imagination. If we look to some created thing to give ourselves our sense of self-worth and happiness that comes from only in ways that God can give, it will eventually fail to deliver and so unmet expectations can be a blessing when they reveal the hidden idols in our hearts. How do you know there's hidden idols in your heart? Watch how you react when things don't go your way. Do you get angry? Do you become depressed? Does it affect your overall sense of well-being or self-worth? You might have a hidden idol or a fixation that God in His mercy is allowing you to be disappointed by not getting it. 
as a way of exposing that in your life. Number four, unmet expectations often involve a thing underneath the thing. A thing underneath the thing. Attorney Anita Harrison recently filed a lawsuit on behalf of Illinois consumers to protect them from a dangerous misrepresentation from a major corporation. According to this federal lawsuit, the Kellogg Corporation is guilty of misleading the public regarding strawberry Pop-Tarts. According to Harrison, they do not contain enough actual strawberries. The lawsuit reads, whether a toaster pastry contains only strawberries or merely some strawberries is basic front-level Im information consumers rely on when making quick decisions at a grocery store. Strawberries are the product's characterizing ingredient. Consumers believe they are present in an amount that is greater than is the case. According to its label, strawberry Pop-Tarts contain 2% or less of dried strawberries, dried pears, and dried apples, and red 40. Harrison claims that the toaster pastries violate Illinois Consumer Fraud and Deceptive Business Practices Act, which specifies as unlawful any false pretense, false promise, misrepresentation, or concealment, suppression, or omission of any material fact. Why do I mention that? Often we expect strawberries from Pop-Tarts. We expect strawberry Pop-Tarts only to later realize they have more dried apples and pears than strawberries. Here's the metaphorical meaning. And our, our need for things to go perfectly in life often is a cover for something else underneath the surface. There's a story behind our expectation. What I really wanted and thought I was getting is not here. There's a thing underneath the thing. I once knew someone who had a birthday party on Christmas Eve. Uh, can you imagine that, having your birthday on Christmas Eve? And as a kid, this person, th their parents would just say, uh, just go pick a present from under the tree. And so over the course of their life, they felt unseen by their own family. And so the rule is you can't celebrate that person's birthday on the same day as Christmas. You have to have a different celebration. Not because they are a diva that needs a lot of attention, but simply because they have a desire to feel seen and celebrated by their family. That's the thing underneath the thing. When Jesus was born into this world, there were people that were immediately ready to receive him with joy. But almost never was it the people you would expect. It was shepherds to whom God gave his revelation. It was a peasant girl that was chosen to carry the Son of God. It was not a princess. It was wise men from a far off place, not the leaders and teachers of Israel. Underneath people's resistance to the Son of God was often unexamined assumptions about the way that God must act and how God can and cannot be. And Jesus' arrival brought out the thing underneath the thing for many people. There was many people in Israel that wanted to see, that wanted nationalistic independence. And that was the thing underneath the thing with their disappointment with Jesus. Other times it was an inability to imagine a God who would come down into the human experience and suffer and die on a cross. There was often a thing underneath the thing with people's rejection of Christ. In your life, when your expectations are unmet, what's the thing underneath the thing? You need to ask yourself that. So how do we defeat this villain of unmet expectations. I just want to offer a couple practical things that, that hopefully are helpful to you. Number one, maybe you need to write a prayer of lament. A lament is a type of prayer where we're just honest with God and our Bible's full of lament. It's a prayer of complaint to God. It's being honest with God about the way things are. It's telling God that you're hurt because of the way life has turned out or something going on in your life. Um, Psalm 22, the most famous song of lament and it's uh, when Jesus quotes this from the cross, here's what it says. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? That's a psalm of lament. As you experience unmet expectations and disappointments at Christmas and in life, a helpful practice is to write a prayer of lament. How do you do that? If you look at all the psalms of lament and prayers of the lament in the Bible, Often they have the same components, so maybe this is a good template for you to sit down over the next week or two and write a prayer of lament about the last year. There's five parts. Number one is an address to God. Number two is a review of God's faithfulness in the past. 
Number three is the complaint. Number four is a confession of sin or a claim of innocence. Number five, a request for help. Number six, God's response, which is often not stated, but sometimes it is. And number seven, a vow to praise God and a statement of trust in God in spite of your lament. We don't do lament very often in the church. And if you look at all the worship songs we sing, 95% of them are celebratory and triumphant. All of our songs are emotionally focused. But if you look at the church history, the church has a rich history of lament. And in light of all of life's disappointments, maybe we need to discover some songs of sorrow to sing to God over the reality of life and the reality of the world that we live in. Um, I actually started reading a great book recently called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. And it's all about recovering this language of lament. If that's something you're struggling with, I think uh, with disappointments in your life, maybe you need to write a prayer of lament for yourself as a result of this sermon. Calvin, from the, the comic Calvin and Hobbes, once wrote, Dear Santa, every year I send you a list of what I want for Christmas, and every year you callously ignore it and bring me practical things I don't even want at all. What's the deal? Are you insane? Have you gone senile? Can't you read? Are you just a vindictive, twisted oaf bent on destroying little kids' dreams? Hobbes read the letter, his imaginary tiger friend, and said, you know, you might want to sleep on this one. And Calvin replied, I know, but it felt good to write it. And I think the reason God gave us this language of lament in the Bible is because we need that. We need to get some of those emotions out. We need to be honest with God instead of pretending to be good Christians all the time and painting a smile on our face and just singing pretty songs that are triumphant and celebratory all the time. We need a language of complaint. Uh, I went to seminary at Fuller Theological Seminary, and there's a guy at my school that actually did an interview with Bono, the lead singer of U2, and Eugene Peterson, the writer of the message. Take a look at what they said here. So we need, to, we need to recover that language of lament so we can be honest about our pain and hurt before God when we're disappointed in life. Number two, you need to, if, if you want to deal with unmet expectations, you need to find out a strategic way to celebrate Advent. Advent is the Latin word which simply means coming or arrival. And it's the four, weeks, four to five weeks leading up to Christmas where we do what we can to stir up the expectancy and prepare our hearts to celebrate the birth of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. Reading a good Advent devotional or a Bible reading plan is a great way to do that. And it's also a great way to calibrate our hearts to fixate on the Savior, not on our expectations. When we don't prepare our hearts, when we don't uh, spend time in the Word preparing for Christmas and these important times of the year, they kind of just come and go. And we get caught up in all the busyness of the season and the expectations we have. And so Maybe you need to figure out a strategic plan to celebrate Advent and calibrate your heart. And if you're looking for a good Advent devotional, I would recommend this one by Paul Tripp. There's uh, hundreds of them out there, but this one is kind of new in the last couple of years. Paul Tripp, it's called Come Let Us Adore Him. There's a daily reading. It started December 1st, so you can get caught up. It is a great devotional reading for Advent to prepare your heart for Christmas and to focus on the Savior. Lamentations 3.25 says, The Lord is good to those who hope in Him, to the one who seeks Him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. That's what we do in Advent. We are waiting for the Lord's arrival. We're not waiting for my expectations to be fulfilled. A lot of things I want for my life will never be fulfilled this side of eternity. We are waiting for Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Number three, Look for God in the unexpected memories created along the way. That's one of the coolest things about when your expectations are unmet. Often things turn out in a way that was way better than had they been met. On Saturday, November 13th, I did something I never thought I would do. I did something no one else saw, something that had no outward evidence that it actually had happened. Um, and you need to know that I was raised to hate KU and Lawrence as a kid, because uh, obviously we're K-State fans living in Manhattan, and KU was where all the liberals and hippies go to college. But on this particular day, on November 13th, I found myself celebrating KU's football victory over Texas 
by one point. Now, K-State friends of mine were celebrating KU's friends. That's like what's happening to the universe. Why were we celebrating? Because no one expected it to happen. Now, God, I think, loves to show up in ways that we would never expect or we never could have planned uh, just to bring us more joy. I think he's a God that loves to do that. Consider the Christmas story that we're celebrating this season of Advent. The Messiah, no one expected to co- him to come the way that he did. No one expected him to be born in a barn instead of a castle. No one expected him to be revealed first to shepherds instead of princes. Things never go our way. Expectations are, are often disappointed. Many times in my life, God has shown up the most clearly at times where I was disappointed. Somebody wrote this, God's greatest appointments with you often are in the middle of life's greatest disappointments. I love that quote. Philip Yancey in his book, Disappointment with God, wrote, faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. In the moment, it seems like an extraordinary inconvenience or an annoyance, uh, but often the painful thing that we're going through and the life-altering thing that we're going through when our expectations are unmet, retrospectively, we're able to celebrate that very thing because of God's amazing wisdom in the memories we created along the way because things didn't go according to our plan. And so we need to look for God in the unexpected memories along the way. And here's the last thing that I have here. Uh, as we approach Christmas, the way to deal with unmet expectations is don't just look at the crib, look at the cross. As we prepare ourselves to be amazed by the Son of God on His arrival in this world, don't get caught up with the expectations that you have for the holidays. Look instead to the cross of Jesus. The cross was the greatest disappointment of the disciples' lives. All their hopes they put in Jesus, all their hopes were dashed. In fact, Simeon even told Mary, no matter how adorable her baby son looked, Mary, I'm sorry, but a sword will pierce your soul too. The shadow of the cross from the beginning had cast itself over the baby Jesus. And there on the cross, years later, Jesus suffocated for six hours and gave up his life for the sins of you and I. And so you can either be bitter like Clark Griswold and angry and resentful and stressed because of all the expectations you have that are going met, that are often really about something else that you're holding on to way too tightly. Or you can look at the cross of Jesus where he endured hell and you can encounter his all-sufficient grace that follows us even in life's disappointments. Let me close with this old poem that I read this week from an unknown author. And it says this, Little headaches, little heartaches, little griefs of every day, little trials and vexations, how they throng around our way. One great cross, immense and heavy, so it seems to our weak will. Might be born with resignation, but these many small ones kill. All of life is formed of small things. Little leaves make up the trees. Many tiny drops of water blending make the mighty seas. Let us not then by impatience mar the beauty of the whole, but for love of Jesus bear all in the silence of our soul, asking him for grace sufficient to sustain us through each loss and to treasure each small offering as a splinter from his cross. Let me pray for us. Father, I know 2021 has been difficult for a lot of people. There have been a lot of hopes that have been shattered. There have been a lot of pains and wounds that people have received. It's been a hard year for a lot of people. And Lord, I pray that in light of our disappointments with life, may we keep our eyes and hearts open to the ways that you want to show up and surprise us. And may we focus all of our attention in these coming weeks, not not on our dream of Christmas or our desire for Christmas or even our hopes for our own lives, but may we focus our eyes on the cross, the greatest disappointment of the disciples' lives, but also in short order, the greatest glory of history because you rose back from the dead. So we wait and watch expectantly for the ways that you're gonna show up. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. We're getting ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. 
If you haven't done so already, I want to encourage you to gather some crackers and juice in preparation for a time of communion. In just a few moments, we'll take the elements together. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 tells us how the Magi came to Jerusalem and they asked, Where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and we've come to worship him. Where is the one who has been born King? Friends, it is so important for us to remember that Jesus, the one that we've been celebrating during our time of worship today, and the one that we celebrate during this time of communion, is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He left the throne room of heaven and He came to this earth. And in the process, He was born like no other. However, this King was born not just to reign, but to sacrifice His life so that you and I could be saved. He was born to lay down His life and pay the debt for our souls. You know, I love the old song, Amazing Love, How Can It Be, that you, my King, would die for me. Friends, that's exactly what King Jesus did for us. This little babe, born in a manger, grew up to be a man. And in 33 short years, just a few miles away from his humble place of birth, his kingship would once again be confirmed. In Matthew 27, 27, it says, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium, and they gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him, and then they twisted together a crown of thorns and they set it on his head. And then they put a staff in his right hand and they knelt before him, mocking him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And then, then they led him to Golgotha and they nailed him to a cross. And above his head, they nailed a sign meant to mock him. But instead, it revealed again who he actually is. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Friends, this child whom we celebrate today, this child who was born in a humble manger, this child is Christ the King. And He came with one purpose in mind, to demonstrate God's love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, He would go to the cross and die for us, so that we might be saved. This is what we're called to remember during this time of communion. With all that in mind, with all that in mind now, Let's get ready to take communion together. And as we do so, let me remind you of the words that are found in 1 Corinthians 11, 24, which says, when Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so friends, let's take the bread that you've prepared. And let's eat it together. And as we do so, let's remember Jesus' body that was torn and broken on our behalf. Verse 25 says, In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so let's drink the cup together, and let's remember Jesus' blood that was poured out and shed on our behalf, so that our sins could be forgiven. Father, thank you so much for demonstrating how much you love us by allowing your son to die on the cross on our behalf. You did that while we were still sinners, which is just amazing to me. Thank you. Thank you for laying down your life for each of us who are here today. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your wonderful name that we pray. Amen.
that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. In the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. In the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of all shall not kneel, shall not fade. And by His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. I am so glad you worshiped with us today. My name is Kip Nelson. I'm the online campus pastor here at Legacy. I hope that you've been both blessed and challenged by today's message. If you have any questions, or maybe you wanna know what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I would love to connect with you. So if you would go to info.lcc.org, click tell us you're here, and then click meet a pastor. Myself or one of our team will reach out to you. Thanks again for worshiping with us today.